Many people assume that investing in property is the best way to make passive income, but that isn't always true. I know lots of investors who spent years building a portfolio that sucked up all their time and money, yet they still aren't on track to reach their financial goals. And that's because they don't understand the game. They don't understand the sequence of steps they need to take in order to build a profitable and passive property business. But luckily for us, there's a very simple way to learn these steps, and it involves an actual game, Monopoly. So in order to best explain what I mean, let's start by looking at the story of Tina. Tina graduated from university, got herself a good job, and diligently started saving money. Clearly, Monopoly was her favorite game growing up because she gravitated towards property. And as soon as she could afford to buy the cheapest property in her area, she combined her savings with a mortgage and bought a book standard two bedroom terraced house. By the time she'd rented it out, and after all her expenses, was putting 150 pounds into her pocket every month. But Tina wasn't done. She kept on saving hard. And every year, she's able to buy another property. As the years went on, she was able to grow her portfolio even faster sometimes refurbishing properties to increase their value, sometimes taking the opportunity to refinance the house that increased in value, pulling out cash to invest into her next deposit. By the time she turned 40, Tina had an amazing 20 properties, paying her a total of £3,000 per month. This sounds like a success story, a victory for working hard, being disciplined and sticking with it. And it is. Almost anyone would agree that this is an enviable position to be in. But life for Tina is not as perfect as it first appears. For a start, Tina's margins on these cheap properties are very slim because a small cost like a gas safety certificate costs pretty much the same with your renting out a property for £500 or £5,000. So just small items of maintenance can wipe out a month's profit. And even though she owns 20 properties, which is a lot, far more than most landlords, the £3,000 per month that she's bringing in isn't enough for her to leave her job. So even though her properties are all managed by agents, there's still a lot of admin, mortgage applications, and issues to deal with that Tina needs to juggle in evenings and weekends. And there always seems to be something going wrong because as a vast generalization, when you have the cheapest properties, they're not going to be the most desirable and you can't be selective about the tenants you rent to. So even if that's only the case in 20% of Tina's portfolio, that's still four properties at any given time where there could be tenants who are behind on the rent or causing issues or even even having to be evicted. So as we established, Tina's done well, but she's forgotten the lessons she learned from playing Monopoly growing up. Remember how the game normally plays out. You start with a small amount of cash, and when you can, you build houses on the cheapest properties, like the old Kent Road. As you pass go, collect £200 and save up the rent from other people landing on your squares, you upgrade those houses to hotels and start to build on more prime locations like Park Lane. However, in Tina's case, she's just built 20 houses on the old Kent Road without ever upgrading to bigger properties or more expensive postcodes. And that's a mistake that many, many investors make. Most people assume the more properties you own as an investor, the more successful you are. Some people even brag about the size of their portfolio and wear it as a badge of pride. But the most successful and the most relaxed investors know that this isn't the case. What really matters is not how many properties you own, but the amount of equity your portfolio has. Say the overall value of your portfolio is made up of 50% mortgage debt and the other 50% is your equity. If you have 50% equity in 20 properties that are worth £100,000 each, that's a million pounds that's yours. That's fantastic. But I'd rather have 50% equity in five properties that are each worth £400,000. My portfolio of five properties sounds less impressive to brag about, but it gives me the same million pounds of equity and it's so much easier to manage. Why? Well, every property represents another boiler that can break and tenant that could go rogue. Fewer properties, fewer problems. And with more prime properties, you can be more picky about the tenants you take on, which means you're likely to have fewer issues. If Tina went down this route, she might even be able to self-manage, cut the agents out of the loop, and therefore have more profit for herself and less work to do. And there's one more benefit that's more important than any of this. When it comes to capital growth, it's prime properties that tend to go up in value first and fastest. So yes, a rising market has helped Tina out over the years, but chances are, if she'd owned more desirable properties, she would have experienced more capital growth, ultimately ending up with more equity from the same amount of cash that she originally invested. So knowing all the benefits of owning more prime properties, shouldn't you just do that from the start? Well, ideally, yes, but 
Unlike in Monopoly, in real life, everyone starts from a different position. If you're able to buy higher quality properties from the start, that's an approach I'd endorse. But you don't have to, and most people don't. Most people can't afford to do anything other than start at the cheaper end of the market. And it's better to do that and own something rather than spend years and years hoarding cash. And even people who can afford to often end up buying cheaper properties because on paper, the yield seems higher and they just can't resist. However much they hear about the extra work and how the returns are never as good as they appear after a for maintenance and issues, they have to experience it for themselves to learn the lesson. I'm not judging. For me, both of those were the case. I still own old Ken Road type properties now, which frankly, I'd rather not. But as time has gone on, I have consolidated, selling some of my cheaper properties and buying a smaller number of quality assets. And while Tina could have started this process earlier, it's not too late for her to do it now. And there's no rush. A change of strategy is something that can play out over years, taking advantage of hot markets to sell assets into and quality markets to snap up bargains. I used to have the view that you should never sell a property, and it's an opinion that many investors share. After all, it seems crazy to sell an asset that's putting money into your pocket every month. But now, I've come to look at property investment as one big game of monopoly that runs for decades. So, as long as you play it straight and aren't forced to go directly to jail, your portfolio is something that can keep on evolving, growing in value and simplicity even as it shrinks in size. So having the right strategy is great, but you don't want to be taking a chance every time you add to your portfolio. Because there's no getting away from it. Every time you make a property investment, you're putting tens of thousands of pounds at risk. And that's real money, not monopoly money. So how can you be sure that it'll be worth it? And what seems like a bargain deal won't cost you a fortune further down the line. Well, watch this video next, where I share the method for analyzing a property deal that I've been honing for more than 15 years. And I give you a spreadsheet that you can use to easily copy it yourself.